It is a beautiful sunny day here in the woods. I want to talk to you a bit about winter foraging today and we'll head into the kitchen to make some wild cheese. Well, even though it's minus 15 out, I'm still enjoying my walk here in the woods. Um, everything's pretty much gone to sleep here for the winter. You know, I've always got my eyes peeled though for wild edibles when I'm in the forest. The trees are really creaking today, they're frozen. <laughs> So there's lots of mushrooms in that that can come out during the winter time, usually during periods of warm up or um, when there's a lot of moisture uh, in the environment. But by and large, most of them have uh, gone dormant for the winter time and will come back up in the spring. So I can't wait for that. There are still some mushrooms out this time of year, but some of them are frozen. Uh, if it warms up a little bit, there are some that will come out and flush. For example, the one on this beech tree right here. Since it's a pretty cold day today, um, the mushroom is actually frozen. But uh, just because winter time doesn't mean you shouldn't keep your eyes out for wild edibles. Other mushrooms I tend to find in the winter time around here that can still be used are the turkey tail. I found a bit the other day on a log. It was pretty cool. It tends to dehydrate over the winter, and I guess as long as it doesn't uh, look like it's full of algae or other unsavory items when it's in the woods over the winter time, it can be harvested. Um, just make sure it's you know some from this fall, not a really old specimen. Over here we have some violet-toothed polypore that has frozen over for the winter, so not the turkey tail like I showed before. So this one isn't an edible, but it's beautiful because underneath it has a like a purplish kind of color and it has little teeth um, underside, on the underside of the polypore here on the shelf. So here you can't really appreciate the purple very well anymore, um, but you can certainly see the teeth. It's like the purple color's kind of leached out um, since freeze up there, but underneath, you know, very toothed, not smooth like the um, turkey tail. Here I have a sample of turkey tail and you can see the colored bands on the surface of the mushroom. Underneath the turkey tail is usually a pale white to cream color. This is an older specimen, so it's got that cream color and little teeny weeny pores underneath. So this is the turkey tail mushroom and that's in contrast to what I just showed you, the violet tooth polypore. This is a medicinal mushroom um, and has a lot of reported immune system benefits as well. I ingest it uh, in the form of tea. Of course, another thing you can find in the woods in the wintertime is birch chaga and it has a lot of purported health benefits. Let's take a look over here and see if we can find any. Well, no luck there. I'll show you what it looks like a little bit later. What we're actually looking for is a fungus that sort of grows off of uh, white birch and it looks black in color. It looks like a ball, it's kind of black in color. When you cut it, it is brown on the inside. It has a lot of reported uh, health benefits, including those for the immune system. Um, some really think it helps with inflammation and uh, cancer and things like that. So it's been very, very popular. Um, I've made tea out of it before. It's very tasty, it kind of tastes woody, kind of like a mushroom. So uh, we'll take a look at that a little bit later. Of course, this time of year as well, you can harvest you know, pine needles, um, balsam needles to make tea. That would be just fine. Also, if you find some uh, known edible wild berries that have dried on the um, shrubbery um, since the fall, they'd be fine to eat as well. They're probably a bit dehydrated, but please make sure you know what you're harvesting um, when you find it. You do not want to eat a poisonous berry. Way up on top of this tree, you can see some more shelf fungus. From a distance, you would think it would look like chaga, but as you know, chaga does not grow on uh, trees other than birch. I mean, most commonly it grows on birch, there's a few exceptions. Uh, but this is a beech tree, so that's not chaga. Um, it looks like it from a distance, that big black ball, but actually if you look at it more closely, it's sort of a fungus that's coming out like a polypore, got lots of different layers to it, um, and it's sort of rotting for the winter. I'm not the only one out on a forge today, looks like a squirrel. I was digging around looking for a, a cache uh, for a nut that probably hid back in the fall or in the summertime. Well, fortunately, uh, in the spring, summer, and fall last year, I did a lot of foraging and harvesting, and I have a lot of things dehydrated 
for use this time of year. So even if I was to go out and not really find anything uh, in terms of wild edibles this winter, I've got my stocks from the past seasons. So what I want to do today is show you how to make uh, a wild cheese ball. Uh, everybody loves cheese balls for parties and stuff like that. So uh, I made this over the holidays. I know I, I posted a bit of a, a quick story on it to my Instagram stories. Uh, if you missed that, today I'm going to show you how I made my wild cheese ball. Um, basically made it from goat's milk, some yarrow, sweet fern, and some wild mushrooms that I harvested and dehydrated from last summer and fall. So let's head into the kitchen right now and warm up and make a cheese ball. It's a really quick and easy recipe if you have guests coming over and you need to entertain. Back inside I just wanted to show you a few books that I use uh, for you know my foraging and also for my wild food recipes. I'll just uh, scan them here so you can get a note of their titles. One I really like especially here is the Edible Wild Plants Guide and it organizes it by season. So you know if we go back towards the back of the book we're back into the winter months and it talks about certain things that you can harvest in the winter. Um, you know, the staghorn sumac, of course, you can find possibly some dehydrated high bush cranberries. Uh, if you're lucky, sometimes the birds get into those. Again, be really, really careful, you know, when you're harvesting wild berries in the winter because some things, you know, the leaves aren't there. You know, you really have to know what your bark looks like and perhaps have scudded out a few bushes or trees uh, in the summer or fall months know what you're looking for so I really like this one because it organizes the uh, wild edibles in terms of season um, you know the Peterson field guides you cannot go wrong there this one I got for Christmas and is really interesting and tells you all about wild edibles boreal herbal also focuses on the medicinal aspects of the uh, things you're going to forage for so it's very useful I've got a lot of mushroom books but one I've really enjoyed is one I got off Amazon by Miller uh, Miller squared <laughs> called North American mushrooms it's really neat that lots of good pictures there uh, and tells you if they're edible, non-edible, or poisonous. Lots of beautiful pictures there. There are the honey mushrooms. So today I want to show you how to make a wild cheese ball and my recipe actually comes from Pascal Baudard's book, The New Wild Crafted Cuisine. Lots of great stuff in here will really change uh, your thoughts on uh, you know wild edibles and, and just really open uh, your mind to cooking lots of delicious things. So we're going to make this today the wild cheese ball uh, and here's the recipe and how to make basic wild cheese. I'm going to be using about a liter of milk today to make a small cheese ball and of course I'm using my own wild foraged herbs and mushrooms to do it. So let's head to the kitchen. Today I'm going to be using the 3.8% goat milk so I'm going to have it on the stove here just to, to warm up. Uh, you want to just get to a light boil and then turn it off before adding in the vinegar to curdle the milk into curds and whey. You don't want it to burn on the bottom of the pan so you may want to just lightly stir it periodically. We're at a boil now so I'm going to just turn off the heat here and add my, I'm going to add an eighth of a cup of just plain household vinegar and you're going to see the milk curdle right away. Look at that, see? That's the curds and whey forming. So we'll remove it from the heat and let it cool down for about five minutes. While we're waiting I wanted to show you what chaga looks like. So this was um, removed from a birch tree and you can see that it sits on the birch tree like so. So you can see it's sort of a shape kind of like a, a ball. It's black uh, and attaches right onto the bark. You can see the inner part of the mushroom is actually a light brown color. So what I do is I let this dry for a while and then I break it up into chunks and put a, a few chunks in a couple liters of water to make a tea. When you make the chaga tea, the chunks will sit in the water and um, heat slowly for several hours uh, to extract all the important nutritional benefits from the chaga. And of course, you can strain out the old chunks of chaga, dry them out, and use them again for another tea at a later date. It stores very well too, so um, once you've dried it out, you can kind of leave it in a nice, cool, dry place to store for later use. One of the things I'm doing while I'm waiting for the uh, milk to finish curdling there and to cool down is getting my spice mix ready. So what you can see here is I've got a clove of garlic and about a teaspoon of wild forged herbs and mushrooms that I collected this summer. In there is yarrow, sweet fern, dehydrated hedgehog mushrooms, as well as dehydrated chanterelle mushrooms. So it's going to be really tasty. So the hedgehog mushrooms dried out really nicely. I usually store my dried mushrooms in paper bags in dry, cool areas. Then my herbs I usually keep in glass jars. So here's some sweet fern from last summer. Line a colander um, on top of a pot with some cheesecloth in it and you're going to pour in your curds and whey. You just want the cheese curds for this recipe. So we're going to let them sit there and drain for a moment.
using a fork to mix in the spices to the cheese makes the job a little bit easier too. Now let's mix it up into a ball shape. It might be a little bit tricky to do this. The cheese gets very crumbly, um, but we're going to kind of make it in that sort of a shape. Just gently forming it into a ball. At this point, I'll add a few more little spices to sprinkle on top. So this is a little bit more yarrow. Remember to use spices that you know are safe to eat. Um, so that's kind of a wild spice that I'm using. But you can make up your own mixture and it's lots of fun. I'm also going to put some pieces of king bowl eat mushroom that I foraged from New Brunswick. Uh, I smoke dried them over our fire pit when I was there and I brought them back. Oops. So we're going to just decorate the top of the cheese ball with that. Now we want the cheese ball to cool and really condense and become firm um, in the fridge. So what I need to do is I need to um, put it in some saran wrap. So I'm going to flip it over into the saran wrap so that my, uh, my little king bowl eats are on the bottom. I'm going to gather this up and sort of again form it into a ball, a nice compact ball. This will allow the curds to stick together when they're in the fridge and it cools down. So I just kind of put in the shape I want and then I kind of twist it off like that. And then it, uh, you can see my little decorations on the top there, the King Bowl lead as well as the Yarrow. So let's put that in the fridge. It'll be in the fridge overnight until the following day. If you're really in a bind and guests are coming over in a few hours, all it needs is just to cool down um, you know, as much as possible. So you can put it in the fridge for about two to three hours. Let's put it in overnight. I like that because it uh, the dehydrated mushrooms rehydrate a bit, really infuses the cheese with that wonderful flavor. And here it is. After 24 hours of chilling in the fridge, it is now a firm cheese ball and ready to enjoy. I like to plate it on a wooden board and uh, just put a little bit of wild decorations on the outside of it to, to garnish it. So I've got some white pine there. Next would I have some saltines or you can have um, use any kind of crackers that you want. So I'm going to enjoy this and I want to show you sitting right here, if those of you who've been following my Facebook and Instagram know I've been into uh, producing a bit more of the wild sodas. Um, so this is a fermentation of cranberries, uh, organic cranberries, organic lemon, turkey tail, and I'm using, there's also ginger in there as well, and raw honey. So it's fermented very nicely. I want to show you the kind of fizziness that I get um, when I have these wild sodas. It's very carbonated. Wow. <laughs> now if that was right to the top, you were going to get a little geyser, a little champagne moment. But it is so good. Can't resist. I made two bottles this time. It's very effervescent. Well, let's enjoy our snack. I'm going to try the wild soda first. Mm. That's really good. You can really taste the lemons and the cranberry. And because I put raw honey in there um, as a source of my wild yeast and uh, to sweeten up the drink, it's not as sour as you think having the cranberries and lemons in there. Now, let's try the cheese ball. It's very, very good, very fresh cheese. I usually would consume this within the week to enjoy it at its maximum potential. That is really good. Very subtle flavors of the mushrooms and the herbs in here. And of course the garlic shines through. That is excellent. Really a good thing to impress your guests with at your next dinner party. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video this week and learned a little bit about, um, you know, adventuring in the kitchen with wild food. That's one of my resolutions this year is to eat more wild food. I think it's really important. I hope you guys have a wonderful week as always. Take care.